Change me, oh God. Make me more like you. Change me, oh God. Wash me.
Good morning, and welcome to the worship services of Crossroads United Methodist Church. I am Reverend Dr. Adrienne Zachary, and it is my joy to invite you here as we worship and praise the name of the Lord. How pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity, for this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And so on today, it is my joy to stand before you and first just ask you to put your hands together and give God some praise. Why are you praising him, beloved? You're praising him because he's a good God. We praise him because there is none other in the world like him. We praise him for a reasonable portion of health and strength and to be enclosed in our right mind. We praise him for the very breath that we breathe that keeps us and makes us to know that we are alive. And so on this morning, I just invite you to give God praise wherever you are on today. For he is a good God and his mercy endureth to all generations. I believe that it is absolutely important for us as the body of Christ to affirm our young people. And I say young, I'm not necessarily meaning numerically, but what I do believe, beloved, is that there is an attack by the enemy on our young people. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to stand and be first time responders in the ways in which we come and to give protection to our young people. And so on today, I invite you to join me in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. The Kohelet, the preacher, preaches and speaks through the book of Ecclesiastes. We will be reading out of the 12th chapter, the first verse and the 13th verse. Ecclesiastes 12 and one. I will be reading out of the NIV version of the Bible and I invite you beloved to join me. Here is the word of God. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Verse 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of humanity. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Let's give thanks to God. Let us pray. God in heaven, we bless you and we thank you for this day. God, we are reminded who we are and whose we are as I stand before this august body of believers. I bless you and I thank you, God, for the opportunity, God, to speak into places and spaces by virtue of this social media platform that your word would be spread with power and with the anointing. I ask you, God, now that you would hide me behind the cross, that there would be absolutely no flesh to glory in your sight. Less, oh, less, oh, less, of me, oh God, is my prayer. I ask you now, God, to move in this moment. God, illuminate your word, that your word would be transformative and that we would not leave the way that we came. I bless you and I thank you for the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but the word of God promises to last forever. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are my strength and redeemer. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray that the church say amen. Beloved, as we move in this worship experience, I invite you to have your communion elements near 
as we will move into the, our celebration of the great Thanksgiving. On today, beloved, from this passage of scripture, I want to glean this topic, show them who you are. It was in the first film of Black Panther. And I would offer to you on today that Black Panther, the movie and its sequel have by far been one of the most anticipated movies in the history of cinema. That when we look at what Black Panther offers to not only us who are in the black culture, a way by which we are able to see black excellence, black family structure, and the ability to have legacy and generational blessings that I would offer to you on today that we were able to witness that kind of development in watching Black Panther and Wakanda. That Wakanda, my beloves, is a fictitious kingdom that was developed in the, on the continent of Africa. Wakanda depicts a place where both the indigenous and those who have tradition were honored and respected while the advancement of technology and innovation was celebrated. During the first Black Panther, in the midst of this film, there was a scene that particularly grabbed my attention. What really heightened my emotion and I got so energetic and so engaged was in this scene when T'Challa, we honor and respect Chadwick Bowen who has now gone on to be with the Lord. But in this particular scene in the first Black Panther movie, T'Challa found himself challenged by Mabaka in this way of a ceremonial ritual to crown who was king of the country. That in this particular scene, there was an intense fight that had a spellbound as we watch these two robust black warriors fight to the death to see who would be the king of that tribe. That in that intensity, we were on the edge of our seat, not knowing what was going to happen. But in our hearts, I would only offer for myself that I was praying that Black Panther would not be defeated. However, there were moments in that scene by which it was questionable. And so as we tuned in and saw the blows, the hits, the kicks, the fists that were against one another, bold and brave in their own right, we felt with a gasp what is about to happen. And what moment in this challenge, just a slight millisecond, it appeared that T'Challa was getting tired, that the weariness in this fight seemed to be overtaking him. And as we see in this conflict, the scene immediately scans to his mother, Queen Ramonda. In this moment, his mother, who is the matriarch of their tribe, in this moment, as she sees history and legacy in the very throes of the way in which this conflict has happened, that in that moment, Queen Ramonda says, show him who you are. I submit to you on today that these words sent chills throughout my body, that the power surge that happened when this mother reminded her son of what it was that she knew him to be. 
It was a bolt of lightning that flitched, that flipped a, a switch that reminded me to stand in the divine truth of who I am and who you are. During challenging times, brothers and sisters, and if we be honest with ourselves, in the last almost three years, we have all, regardless of where you live, your social location, your gender, or your race, have experienced challenges that have been many times seemingly unsurmountable. And so in this time when you might be weary, tired, frustrated, and confused, I came by as God's little errand girl to let you know that we can get so worn down by life that we can find ourselves in the grips of despair and disillusionment. But I came by to let you know on today as the queen reminded her son to child, show them who you are. And we recognize at the end of that scene that T'Challa was able to surmise and to mount the strength of who he was. That he defeated Mabaka and was able to take the right throne to be the king as he knew he was. That when we look at this text on today, Ecclesiastics, as I said, is said to be written by the preacher. That the Kohelet, the preacher, the homiletic, the hermeneutic that would give us to look at this text on today reminds us, beloved, of what it means to be one of a youth. That we are reminded, brothers and sisters, in this text of where we said, where it says, remember thy creator in the days of our youth. That this word would go on to let us know that despite what is reality, that there is a certainty that as young people, that it is possible, beloved, as young men and young women, to choose to serve God faithfully in your youth. That when we look around and see the pressures that are on the outside and the inside, it becomes absolutely imperative that the church would come around to help our young people and to give them nurture, guidance and protection, that they need to be shown who they are, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made in the divine image of who God is, and that God does not make any junk, that irrespective of the images of what we see on TV and in this mass media culture that we live in, that there are still people of color that are making indelible movements in the world in which we live. That when we look at on this last week, this example, that it was LeBron James who at the tender age of 17 years old was the first draft pick and was started his journey as a basketball player at the tender age of 17. On two days ago, we were able to witness that LeBron King James came and he, out of 20 years of playing basketball, is now the highest scorer in the NBA on Wednesday night. Now the highest points are 38,390 points. At 17, he began that journey. Beyonce began her career at the tender age of 15 years old that we are reminded that Beyonce is a faithful member of the St. John United Methodist Church in the city of Houston, Texas. She grew up in the Methodist environment, and on this week, we were able to see that now, Beyonce holds the number one place by those who have Grammys. She now owns and possesses 32 Grammys. And I give this to you today, beloved, because history still is going on. That God has and will continue to use young people to make a change in the world in which we live. That when you have dedication and commitment around young people to help them to live into who they are, as the text tells us on today, remember the Lord in the days of your youth. 
that as we look at the text on today and we look at the Bible in its entirety, we see in the Old Testament examples of those who God used as you. Joseph was about 17 years old when he refused to join his brothers in the evil that they were plotting, that he refused to be a part of the evil deeds that they were trying to put together. Read Genesis 37, 1 and 2. Then we look at David, who in his youth, when he was appointed to go and to kill the Philistine um, Goliath, that as a young boy, when you read 1 Samuel 17, 42 and 47, you see this young man without fear who went to save his people. When we look at Shatmat, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3 and 16, we see three young Hebrews who refused to worship to idols before the king who had brought them. And so I stand to let you know on today, God uses young people that we in the church have become so in, so isolating from the ways in which we allow their creativity and the ways in which they are able to be who God has given them to be. That we must look beyond what the world gives as standards and to see how God would use our young people. Let's look at the New Testament and see the mother of all creation, that Mary was a young woman when God looked down and put the Lord Jesus Christ into her womb. When we look at Timothy, who in his youth served God faithfully and was brought up and reared by his mother and his grandmother, that when we look around and see that if God used young people in biblical days, how much more will he use them on today? Remember who you are in the days of your youth, young people, and to know that God has great things that are planned for you. Number one, as we remember to show you who you are, that we acknowledge that there are pressures on the outside. That when we look at social media and peer pressure, and we look at the images that would bombard you every day of your life, that it makes it necessary that as the church, that we give you the opportunity and, to, and the place to know that God has plans for you. To give you a place by which you learn, that you learn and exercise prayer. That the church be the place by which you learn to appreciate and to come to study the word of God. That the Bible says that the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but the word of God will last forever. And so when we teach you how to pray, and when we teach you how to read the Bible, when we teach you the value of fellowship and being in the church, that the pressures on the outside begin to diminish and decrease because we give you the opportunity to see God in his glory. Pressures from the outside. And then now, beloved, when we look at pressures on the inside, that we as the church must overcome the, the messages and the images that we must move from those dreadful words that have crippled every congregation. We've always done it that way. That I will submit to you on today, beloved, that this is a new time for young people. And that nothing, the Bible says, is new under the sun. But as good Methodists, we recognize that there are changes in the methods by which we evangelize and share the good news of Jesus Christ. So I submit to you on today that those antiquated ways of the ways that you did ministry 50 years ago must absolutely have to be changed. That you must embrace social media. That you must embrace opportunities to move beyond these four walls and to meet young people where they are. That you must move from being critical and judgmental about who you believe God is calling and why. That when we are able to be led by the Holy Spirit, 
that when we are not so afraid of you losing control, that when we open our doors to the church and they come in addicted to drugs, when they come in having experienced alternate lifestyles, when they come in on the edge or on the place of wanting suicide ideations, when they come not having been addicted to drugs and alcohol or prescription pills, that when the church recognizes that the pressures within that would keep young people out of our pews and we wonder why they're not here, that you must make young people a priority in your ministry. That you must intentionally make ways in which the intersection of evangelism and fellowship come into play. You must develop and devote part of your budget to being able to make a youth ministry that has a youth leader that knows the Lord. A youth leader that has experience and expertise in working with young adults young people on Sunday as we exited this congregation for our worship service on Sunday. That as I left the pulpit and I went to gather to greet the members who were leaving, that I was summoned by our assistant pastor. And he said to me, Pastor Adrian, we need you to pray. We were in the vestibule in the front of the church. And as I walked into that vestibule, there was a young woman that was there. And so they said, pray. And so I said, Why, what, what do I need to pray for? And she began to weep. And I stood there and I began to summon from all I knew the Holy Spirit. That I began to pray and the Holy Spirit revealed to me that suicide ideations were in this young woman's mind. We began to intercede and to call for the blood of Jesus to cover in the name of Jesus. We took authority over what the enemy might have meant for evil that God would turn it around for her good. We began to intercede and to plead on her behalf that the grip of the enemy would be destroyed. That I tell you that young lady fell into my arms and wept like a baby. That she began to share with us the very nature of how she had been in a coma and many other myriad of challenges. But I leave that to you on today. That I say to you that unexpectedly God is opening the doors where they will be coming saying, what must I do to be saved? That that was an experience that I shall never forget where this young lady was snatched out of, the, out of the hands of the enemy when she confessed, I promise you, I wanted to kill myself. Beloved, pressures on the outside, pressures on the inside. And then lastly, beloved, as I take my seat, the text tells us on today is that you must show them who they are. That in this climate in which we live, where there is an intentional way by which the culture of African Americans is intentionally being sanitized by their thinking by the right wing, left wing. And that this way of these buzzwords, CRT, that for whatever reason incites such fear for those who are part of a white wing conspiracy and are white supremacists in nature. And I said that to you on today that when we look at T'Challa, when we look at even in that imaginary environment, that we recognize the contribution of those who are African American. That we must not allow the world to tell our story. That we must be intentional on showing our children, not only in the Bible and in the world that they live, 
examples of greatness and excellence. That when we recognize the gift and the benefit that has been given not only to this country, but to the world by those who are of the African diaspora, that when you are able to show young people and they have an understanding on who they are, that they begin to have a pride and a sense of ownership in who and what their destiny will be. That when we show them who they are, that they are able to see in scripture, when we look at the Ethiopian eunuch, when we look at the Queen of Sheba, when we look at Epic Medan in that in, that in the text, when we look at Epic Melet, we recognize that there are those who are of the African diaspora that were men and women that walked through the annals and pages of our holy writ. That when we look at and recognize, my brothers and sisters, that there would be no world history if it was not for black history. And that we can trace our lineage back to the continent of Africa and see ourselves in the many hues and talents that we possess. Show them who they are. Remember, thy creator, young people and the church at large in the days of your youth. And so now, as we are called to remember who you are, <laughs> as you show up in the world in which we live, that you do so courageously, that you do so authentically, that you do so with all the power, both divinely and spiritually, that you have. I came by to let you know on today that we are excellent in our own right. That when we look around and see the way that the world would appropriate what has been called to a part of our culture, that when we recognize that we are intelligent, that we are bona fide geniuses, that when we reckon and come to envelop and to appreciate and to celebrate our creativity, that we, black people are a force to be reckoned with. So when the enemy would come in like a flood, the Bible says that we would lift up a standard against them. So I say to you on today, show them who you are. When you feel like you want to give up, show them who you are. When it looks like your back is up against the wall, show them who you are at every given moment. Know that you are called to be kings and queens. Know that in scripture you were pharaohs, that you were scribes, that you were architects, that you were engineers. Show them who you are, that in this day and time that you see those, that you can be the president of the United States, that you can be the vice president of the United States, that you can hold offices not only in the White House, but in the State House. That when we look the first black mayor of the city of Los Angeles. Show them who you are. Wakanda forever. Amen. At the dawn of the 20th century, America was a country full of promise and hope for many. Black Americans faced a different reality a nation separate and unequal. Yet their hope persisted. Pained by inequality, but inspired by resilience, writer and civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson put pen to paper. His words would become a unifying call, a hope for a brighter tomorrow, a timeless exhortation to lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony of liberty Let it read.
forces that want to take us back to another place. We don't want to go back. We want to go forward. Beloved, I invite you now to join me in our time of the great Thanksgiving. And when we look at the ways in which we invite the opportunity for fellowship, that the Bible tells us that the word for fellowship in the Greek is koinonia. And so when we come to this moment that the sanctification of the elements, the way that God through his son Jesus Christ gave us a living example of the ways in which God loves us. That without question or doubt, the Bible says every time you do this, the celebration of the table. You do this, as the scripture told us today, in remembrance of me. So I invite you that whether you have coffee, tea, juice or water, that whether you have your bread or toast or cracker or such, that as we come into this moment of fellowship, I invite you, beloveds, to be in the spirit of koinonia. That as we begin on today, I invite you to follow me in this confession and pardon. Here is the word of God. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbor. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church family and friends, the Lord be with you and also with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, beloved, to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so now with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy God, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to the, for those to be set free, liberty who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you will save your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, Jesus gave birth to the church. He delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of his word and through the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, eat, take, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to it for it, and then he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink, as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, beloved church family and friends, we come through these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy living sacrifice. We give thanksgiving to God for who he has called us to, to be. That as we do this in remembrance, as we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, as we come in union with Christ's offering for us, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Church family, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. I invite you now to hold your elements before you as we consecrate them afresh in this moment. That as we come today, we ask the Holy Spirit to pour out your spirit on us here today. And for those that are in many places and spaces on this morning. That as we come, we ask that these gifts of bread and wine be made sanctified for our intake as we come on today. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to all of the world until Jesus Christ returns in and for that final victory when we, the church, will feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. We give all honor and glory to you. It is yours only. In the name of Jesus Christ, let us all say amen. And now, beloved, with the confidence of the children of God, I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now. The body of Christ that was given for you and for me. Let us eat and remember. The blood that 
that was shed on Calvary still do as often as you do in remembrance of me. And so we come to that time when we are reminded of that Holy Ghost spiritual. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. Beloved, on this day, know that the blood still works. Know that the power and the authority of the blood still is accessible and available to those who know him as Savior and Lord. And so I invite you now in this moment, in this moment of decision, that the three decisions that I would offer you that need to be made. Number one is do you know Jesus as Savior and Lord? As our text reminds us of today that it doesn't matter how old you are, that I would offer you that the old, younger that you are, that the provision by which the Holy Spirit would give you in your youth would preserve and protect you. But if you are 10, 60, or 90, all you need to do, as Romans says, is to confess the Lord Jesus. To say, I need thee. <laughs> Every hour, I need thee. That after you confess and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, acceptance, believing, and confession brings you into the family of faith. Number two, are you looking for a church home? That here at the Crossroads Church, we extend to you an invitation to join us here. That this is a church that is power-filled, that is full with love, that the Word of God is preached and taught unapologetically. That you can write us, call us, text us, or email to let us know that you have come to be a member of this August body of believers. That one thing that I can say as the lead pastor here at the Crossroads Church, that the doors are open, that anyone is welcome into this church. That I stand before you to let you know that when you either call or come, that we stand with our arms open to welcome you. Welcome, welcome, welcome home. And then lastly, if you need prayer, that we, the church, have prayer online. We have call-in prayer. Prayer saturates the ministry at the Crossroads Church. And so if you need someone to pray with you, the Bible says one would send a thousand a flight, but two would send some ten thousand. So if you feel the need to yoke up or link up with someone that will pray with you and for you, call us, text us to let us know, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray with me. I need you to stand in on my behalf, for the Bible tells us many are the plans of men, <laughs> but the purpose of God will prevail. That my favorite scripture in the entirety of the canon is Jeremiah 29 and 11, and I want to leave that on today by way of benediction, that God has plans for you, plans to prosper you with a hope and with a future. Beloved, show them who 